This is lesson 116 on page 470. It is on the fundamental counting principle. And in a nutshell, <clears throat> what the fundamental counting principle says is, if there are P ways to do one thing and Q ways to do another thing, then there are P times Q ways to do both of those things. I'll give you an example of the fundamental counting principle and show you how it is used in probability. All right, so <clears throat> let's say I'm choosing an outfit out of my closet. I have two pair of shoes. I have five shirts to choose from, and I have three pairs of pants to choose from. All right, two options for shoes, five options for shirts, three options for pants. The fundamental counting principle says, gives me the total possible different outfits that I can make from these three items by multiplying. It's two times five times three, which is 30. 10 times three is 30. 30 different outfits that I can make with this many items. It's like P times Q times Y or S, right? Okay. I use the fundamental counting principle to calculate the total possible outcomes in probability. This is going to be my denominator, okay? So when I'm thinking of probability, the probability of an event occurring, um, an event is like rolling a dice or, or going in my closet and choosing one of each of those or um, picking a card out of a deck of cards, right? Or drawing a marble out of a bucket of marbles. That's an event, all right? Is equal to uh, the positive outcome that what I'm looking for to happen, maybe the red marble, how many red marbles there are, right? Um, over the total possible, possible outcomes. That's the fundamental counting principle, all right? The total possible outcomes. We're counting, right? Now, when we are thinking of, of the counting principle, there's really three ways we're going to count, okay? And I'm gonna call the first one theoretical. It's what we typically do in probability. It's typically theoretical. Oftentimes we have what's called a permutation. This is all under the fundamental counting principles, how we count or we have combinations. All right. <clears throat> So, the theoretical counting principle says, and this is only for the denominator, the total possible outcomes, is always with replacement and order matters. Okay, so let's think I, I roll two dice, okay? That's theoretical. On the first dice, I have six numbers. On the second dice, I have six numbers. I'm just multiplying those six, okay? Let's suppose I have the numbers one, two, and three, and I'm going to order them, the, and I'm gonna use all three of them, okay? The first, in this first box here, I can choose one, two, or three. I have three numbers to choose from. I, 
I put that number back in the pot because <clears throat> we're replacing it and I can choose it again. In this next blank, I can choose three numbers. Likewise, I'm putting that number back and now I still have three numbers to choose from. So, what does this tell me with theoretical? My denominator is going to be 27. My denominator will be 27. What is the probability of getting one specific outcome? It's one over 127. That's theoretical. All right, a permutation. Both permutations and combinations are without replacement. So once I use a number, I'm not gonna use it again. All right, with a permutation, order matters. So a combination is also without replacement, but with a combination, order doesn't matter. We don't care what order it is in, okay? So back to this one, two, three. I'm going to order them in three different places. The first time I pick a number, I have one, two, and three to pick from. I have three numbers to pick from. I've used one. So the next time I draw a number, I only have two to choose from. Now I've used two numbers. This last time, I only have one to pick from. This is where you often see the three with the asterisk mark, that means factorial. And that is on your calculators. It's shift x to the negative one. All right, so I know three times two times one is six. If I hit three, three, well, I gotta turn it on first. Three and shift x to the negative one factorial and hit enter, it's six. It's multiplied three times two times one. So six factorial will be six times five times four times three times two times one. Any number factorial is that number times every sequential number below it to zero, really to one. We're not gonna do times zero to one. Now here's what you, it's how many you can count. You can do this in your calculator, but zero factorial is always equal to one. It's very similar to the concept of two to the zero power is one, very similar to that. It says I can count this one time. That's really what it's saying, okay? All right, so this is when order matters. Look at the options that we have. We'll go ahead and write the permutations. I could have one, two, three. I could have one, three, two. I could have two, one, three, or two, three, one. I could have three, one, two, or three, two, one. Those are my six options. And order matters. Does one come first? Does two come first? Does three come first? What position is it in? Order matters. With a combination, order doesn't matter. I have three numbers, I don't care. There's only one combination. Whereas in permutations, there were six possible permutations. With combinations, there's one. Okay, remember this is only our denominator. So what is the probability of picking one of these? It's one out of six. For this one, it's just one. It's gonna be one over one. Probability will always be between the value of zero to one. And the probability of all the possible events, the sum of it will be one because it has to take into account every possible outcome. So sometimes it's zero to one, Sometimes it's zero to 100%, depending on if we're doing numerals or percents, okay? Now, 
what is the probability of zero? That would be sort of like saying, all right, I have a bucket of five red marbles. What's the probability of drawing a blue marble? Well, that would be zero, right? Clearly. What's the probability of one? It, when will the probability equal one? That would be like saying, I have a bucket of 10 blue marbles. What's the probability of drawing a blue marble? It's one, I'm going to draw one, right? And when will it be between there? That's like, I have three blue marbles, five red and 10 yellow. What's the probability of drawing a blue? It's somewhere between, between zero and one, but the probability of drawing a, I can't remember the colors I use, but the colors, the probability of drawing a yellow plus the probability of calling a, pulling a blue, plus the probability of drawing a red, the sum of them would equal one because that's my only options, okay? All right, so this is looking at our denominator, okay? We're gonna calculate our denominators. But once we've calculated our denominators, I'm just gonna erase the top of this. So that's the fundamental counting principles. This is how we count. When we're looking at events, events, what is an event? Okay. An event is, I think I said this a minute ago, drawing, going, going to my closet and picking out an outfit. That's an event, right? Actually going in to do it or drawing a marble out of the bucket. So when we're looking at events, there's two ways to look at them. Either um, it is mutually exclusive or it is independent. In Dependent. Okay, and, and mutually exclusive, we can use any of these, independent, any of these for the counting principle, okay? Mutually exclusive are events that can't happen at the same time, for instance. And it's typically talking about one event, okay? One event, and can't happen at the same time. All right, think of a Venn diagram. Everything in this circle by itself is mutually exclusive, okay? All right, so let's think of mutually exclusive also. All right, let me erase this. Um, Let's suppose I have a spinner. I'm playing a game. I have a spinner. It's broken down into three sections. One, two, three. When I hit the spinner, I'm either gonna land in one, two, or three. There's no crossover, right? It's either one or two or three. With mutually exclusive, you're gonna hear the word or, right? Key word. I'm adding the probabilities. All right, so what if I asked you, what is the probability of landing on a one or a three? I'm gonna take the probability of landing on a one and I'm going to add it to the probability of landing on a three. It's one spin, I have two options. It's one event, two, uh, two results that have no crossover, right? It's like if I had, a bunch of sports balls, right? Let's say a basketball, a football, a baseball, softball. Basketball, football, baseball, softball. What is the probability of picking a football? Well, there's only one of them. None of the others are football. So it's one out of four. Makes sense? Also like flipping a coin, heads or tails. When I flip it once, what's the probability of getting a heads? It's one half right? If I roll one dice, what is the probability of it landing on a two? That's one out of six. This would also be a mutually exclusive event. If I roll a dice, 
I could ask, what is the probability of it landing on an even number? I'm adding them and it's three out of six, right? There's three even numbers out of six. Does that make sense? I hope it does. Okay. Independent is typically two events. You'll hear the word and, and we are multiplying. All right, so going back to the spinner. Let's say I'm going to spin twice now. And I ask you, what is the probability of landing on a one the first time and landing on a three the second time? Now I'm going to multiply. It's the probability of landing on a one times the probability of landing on a three, right? Two separate events. They have nothing to do with one another. Okay, that's flipping coins, heads or tails. What is the probability of landing on a head the first time and a tail the first time? All right, heads first time, tails the second time. Well, the first time landing on a head is one half times the probability of landing on a tails is one half. It's one fourth. That's the probability, okay? All right, now let's look at your examples on page 471. All right, so walk through this with me. Well, I'm also going to show you something else here. There's a button on your calculator that you can use, and we'll use it with one of the problems. Okay. All right, look at example one on page 471. I'm going to erase these examples and we're going to decide, is it theoretical, is it a permutation, is it a combination? All right. How many different ways can the numbers three, five, seven, and eight be arranged in order? No repetition. It's a permutation. So it's going to be four factorial. Or you can do this in your calculator. There are four numbers. I'm going to permute four of them. I'll show you. You enter, make sure it's on, clear. Four. And then shift this multiplication button. And you'll see the P. Four. and you get 24. I'll get the same number if I do four factorial. I could have done four factorial, which is shift the X to the negative one, hit enter, equal, I get 24. It's a permutation. There are 24 options, okay? Look at 116.2. How many four letter signs can be made from the letters in the word equal if repetition, I'm replacing them, I'm gonna reuse them, is permitted, it's theoretical. So there are five unique letters. Notice there's no repeats in the letters, right? What if I had a repeat? I just used the number of Okay, let's finish this one. Equal. Then I'll get, then I'll show you one. Um, all right, I'm I'm doing five letter signs, so I have five letters. One, two, three, four, five. It's five times five times five times e q u a l. Yeah, times five times five are five letters to the fifth power. How many I'm using? How many letters I'm putting in? Okay. What if I, what if I use the word speed? S P E E D, like speed limit, right? I have two E's, only four unique letters. So when I choose, I'm only gonna have four. It's four times four times four times four times four. 
times four. Still theoretical, but I only have four unique letters. Okay. All right. That's theoretical. Um, look at 116.3. <clears throat> A multiple choice quiz has eight questions. We have eight. I'm just going to draw a circle. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Each question has four options. This is not a permutation. This is theoretical. Because it's probably A, B, C, D. For this one, I have four choices. Four, 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 four. It's four to the eighth power. That's the total possible different arrangements of those letters. Okay? You getting it? I hope. 116.4. How many three-letter signs? Now I have, I'm making a three-letter sign, but I have more than three letters. Um, can be made from the word numeral. That's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, so I have seven letters. If no repetition is allowed, it's a permutation. So I have seven and I'm picking three. I could do that in my calculator. Or right, seven times six times five. All right, 116.5. James has five places. Jamie has five places to put items in her display. She has 38 different items. So she has five places. One, two, three, four, five. 38. How many arrangements are possible? 38. She can't use that, that one item because she's already used it. Times 37, times 36, times 35, times 34. Or you could have done, there's 38. I'm going to permute five of them. You would get the same answer in your calculator. Makes sense? Look on the next page. Page um, 472, 116.6. Now we actually have events. See, here we were just calculating what are the total, what's the total possible outcome? Now we're actually gonna have events, okay? All right, two dice are rolled. Two dice are rolled. I'm thinking independent. I can use those values on each dice twice. So it's gonna be six times six, all right? Makes sense how that goes together. What is the probability of getting a sum of seven. Well, I know my denominator is going to be 36. All right, so I start with one. All right, I'm gonna have two dice. All right, well, to get seven, I can get one and six. I can get two and five. I can get three and four. I can get four and three. I can get five and two, or I can get six and one. There's six different possible outcomes where it equals seven out of 36, and that would be one out of six. And B says a sum greater than eight, greater than eight. All right, my denominator's not gonna be any different because I have the two dice, it's theoretical and independent, so I'm multiplying six times six, now I want a sum greater than eight. Well, the highest I can get with one is seven because one plus six is seven. Two and two and six is eight, so I can't use two as my, my first dice on the left, right? But I can, on my dice, those are pretty pitiful. Three, to be greater than eight, it has to be with six. If I roll a four, I can get a five or a six. If I roll a five, I can get a four, a five, or a six on the other dice. If I get a six, I can get a three, a four, a five, or a six. 
So these are my total pos possible positive outcomes out of 36. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten out of 36. Both are divisible by two, so you would always simplify. Five eighteenths. All right. Look at example 116.7 on the bottom of page 473. A fair coin is tossed three times. Independent. I can use heads or tails every time. What is the probability that heads comes up every time? So we have heads, heads, heads. I'm multiplying because they're independent events. Well, heads is one out of two times one out of two times one out of two, which equals one eighth. I look at page 474, <clears throat> 116.8. A fair coin is tossed four times and it comes up heads each time. What is the probability that it comes up heads on the next toss? I'm just looking for the probability. I don't care what's happened here. What, what is the probability that the next time I toss that coin, it's gonna be heads, it's just one half. We don't care what's happened before, right? We don't. Okay, we need to work problem eight because this lesson introduces a new concept. I need you to know how to solve for this. All right, so this is problem eight on page 474. That's probability, that's a whole lot. I hope you took good notes. All right, they give you this equation. The pH equals the opposite log of positive hydrogens. All right, if you're solving for the pH, this is what you're gonna use. Solving for the pH, you're gonna use this equation. But what if you're solving for the hydrogens? That's what I need to show you, okay? If, if you're solving for the hydrogens, you need to know hydrogens equal. All right, you're gonna take this equation. Really, you're solving for the antilog, okay? First, you have to get rid of that negative. So you're gonna multiply both sides by negative one, and you end up with negative pH equals the log of H positive. The base is 10 because there's no base there. So then you're going to exponents. So 10 raised to the negative pH is going to be what your hydrogens are. And that's how you're gonna go back and forth. Working for high, solving for hydrogens, you're going to exponents. Solving for pH, you're gonna stay in your logs.